and welcome everybody. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us this afternoon or this evening or even this morning depending on where you are viewing from. We're just going to sort of wait 30 seconds or so just to allow everybody to enter the room but just while we are waiting let us know in the chat box where you are joining us from, which country, what city, where are you? Hi, Heike from Germany. Hi, Marlies from, Ge from near Cologne. The UAE, hi, Eloise. So we are spread far and wide this evening. Azerbaijan, wow. Not often we have anyone from, I think we have a colleague of yours there, maybe. Stuart from, Stuart Fraser from Glasgow. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, hello. Um, Kazakhstan, Estonia, Georgia, hi Maya. Wow, it's, it's late in Georgia. I think they're five hours ahead, so that's good going. Um, hi Lali, Azerbaijan, Baku, Macedonia. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar with Emily Bryson. My name's Alex and I'm going to be hosting the session today. Just make sure everything runs smoothly, everything goes okay. Now, before I introduce Emily in more detail, I'd just like to take a very quick moment of your time just to go over some of the functionality of the platform. Uh, first of all, I mean, you've already found the chat icon. And certainly throughout the session, please use the chat as much as you can. Emily, I know we'll be asking some questions to increase interactivity throughout the session. So please, you know, use it appropriately. Don't, you know, start chatting to each other. Please sort of keep it on topic. Also, when you're using the chat, make sure that you are sending it to everyone and not just panelists and uh, hosts. Make sure it's to all attendees or to everyone so that everybody can see your messages. If there are any very specific questions, please use the Q&A box rather than the chat. The reason for this is because these do not fly past like they do in the chat. So any kind of specific questions in the Q&A, please. And we'll have time at the end to go through those questions. Also, just to make you aware that I know the recording is important and the certificate is important for many of you. These will be shared with you tomorrow. So 24 hours from now, Zoom will send an automated email with a link to the recording, a link to the certificate, as well as a link to the lesson plan and a lesson that we've created for you from Voices. Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce you all to Emily. Emily is an ESOL lecturer, a teacher trainer, a blogger, a graphic facilitator, and now co-author of National Geographic Learning's Voices series. In other words, she is a very, very busy lady. And chatting her just now, she, she just runs straight from her classes this afternoon. Her current areas of specific interest are the education of people seeking, seeking refuge, literacy, visual literacy, graphic facilitation, inclusion, and accessibility, which is what she is going to be talking to us all about today. So let's waste no more time. Emily, over to you. Hello, thanks so much for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, um, I'm really excited about the Voices series in general because I think it's done a really good job of accessibility and inclusion. Um, so I want, I'm really excited about showing you all the different uh, bits of Voices that uh, will help your learners to uh, will meet the learner help your learners meet their needs. Um, can't seem to change my slides. Oh no, here we go. Okay, yeah. So Voices is. Um, there are explorers and voices. There's 20 National Geographic Learning Explorers from 23 different countries, many of whom speak different, uh, many different languages. Um, and 
they have and the pronunciation is all um English as a lingua franca so it's focused on um intelligibility there's lots of different voices in there from all over the world stories from all over the world images from all over the world we've got international communication intercultural communication which is obviously intercultural and international so yeah it's big and it's probably it's super global which I absolutely love for it in, the, in terms of accessibility because our learners are multicultural and from all over the world so we have, need to help them to develop their voice and to see themselves within our materials as well so um, Alex has already done a very good job of introducing me so I probably won't spend too much on my, this slide so I'm a graphic facilitator. You will notice that I use quite a lot of pictures throughout this, which is one of the great ways of making things accessible to learners is to include as many pictures as you can and draw them yourself. They don't need to be um, works of art. These are not works of art. Graphic facilitation is more about um, communicating visually. So I, I teach a lot of learners who have literacy needs, maybe um, uh, whose first script is not Roman, um, I teach a lot of learners who maybe have undiagnosed um, specific learning differences as well. Um, I'm a teacher trainer. I've written five books, The Age Said VSOL and 50 Ways to Teach Life Skills, and I am an outdoors fanatic. But I will move on quickly to, in the chat box, over to you. Uh, can you tell me what is accessibility? Can you just uh, explain what your interpretation of accessibility is in the chat box? I'll keep an eye on it. I'm not sure if I've got a bit of a delay in the chat, chat room. It is about being reachable, you're quite right. Yeah, and enabling everyone to take part as much as they can. And it's I'm going to show you the very simple ways of doing this. It doesn't involve rewriting anything or changing anything or creating multiple lesson plans it's just about making simple simple tweaks to the way you teach yeah being able to participate without being scared yeah exactly and being um confident in the classroom yeah and connecting and relatable content as well which is one of the great things about the explorers they talk a lot about um Daily, their daily lives and the food that they like. And so they're real people talking about really relatable context as well. Yeah, the ability to use and access materials, that's exactly it as well. And to use them very simply without having any barriers in place. We often say that it's the environment that's, that's, um, that makes things difficult for people to use it. So we want to break down those barriers to make it easy to use. So, um, okay, so here are some of the things that my students and um, are quite are, that are quite common for uh, language learners um, and actually all people to have that um, you might need to support your learners with. So in the top corner, and I realise I have missed the comma and I've, I've missed the brackets around the H in this one. I will need to go and edit that. So ADHD, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's not necessarily about um, having a attention deficit, it's more about attention overload. So maybe learners with ADHD will focus on lots of different things. They'll be hearing music, they'll be looking at the window, they might, um, if there's too many things happening at the one time, they might not be able to focus. They might also be super chatty, but overly chatty at times. Um, uh, pe uh, people with autism uh, might find it quite hard to uh, connect socially. They might be a little want to be a little bit distanced. Uh, they might have very good memories. All of these are kind of spectrum. Uh, each of these, so maybe everyone is different, um, has a different level. Um, so be aware of that. Um, so uh, some learners might. Um, uh, be able to remember lots of facts. Um, they might take things very literally uh, and also be able to um, take instructions very clearly as well. Um, digital skills. Um, a lot of my learners um, 
uh, really struggle with their digital skills. Some uh, have never held a mouse before in their life. Some don't know how to, when I was, when we were first using Zoom, I, they didn't understand that they had to hit the return key to uh, enter uh, in the chat. They uh, find it difficult to enter their password sometimes. I mean, I think if I was entering my password in an unfamiliar script, I would also find this difficult. Um, so I can totally understand that. Um, dyslexia is about um, words, um, maybe the, the, the difficulty remembering spellings and processing information and re reading and writing words. Um, it can also uh, impact on time management and understanding of time. So it can be quite good to do a bit of um, time management techniques with them. Dyscalculia is about mathematical processing, uh, literacy. So maybe some learners um, from all, they might come from be Farsi speakers or Arabic speakers or Tigrinya speakers whose alphabet is not um, Roman. So it might be quite new to them. They might need some extra support with their phonics or with the reading, even the direction of their letters from right to left and the direction of their reading might can sometimes uh, just need a little reminder of the direction that they're going. Uh, sensory impairments such as hearing or sight or color blindness. So don't rely on one color to um, convey meaning, for example, um, on, on colors in general. So maybe put a box around things or circle things instead so that it's not just colors that are showing um, differences. Uh, mobility, some learners might need additional support with uh, moving around the class or getting to class. Or maybe they might, if they've got a, a sore back, they might need to walk, walk around the class for a little while. So it's about allowing them to do that. Uh, study skills. Um, in my particular context, I have teach students who have, and I'm sure I'm not alone, have different levels of study skills. So some maybe have PhDs and some have been to university where others have very limited um, access to education so or limited experience of education. So they're quite new to it. So it's about teaching them the skills to take notes, for example, or manage their time, or even things like bookmarking pages in their on their mobile phone um, to help them remember where, where to do their homework. So accessibility is about uh, supporting learners from uh, realizing that every learner is different. And some learners might fly. Some learners might go at quite a steady pace and some learners might take a little bit more support. So it's about accessibility, but making changes to get the steps right for each learner. Um, and I'm sure you've probably been chatting about this already. I'm sorry that I've not noticed all the chat stuff, uh, content in the chat, but these are this is a visual template, which I use quite often with my students to get them to think about um, their challenges that they face. So if you could just have a think in the chat room, uh, what challenges do your learners face when it comes to accessibility issues or when it comes to accessibility? So one of the things I love about uh, visuals and um, creating your own simple drawings in class is um, that there's no text on them. So uh, it's quite good for students with uh, dyslexia or students who have limited literacy because there is no text. They don't need to process any of that. Um, you can just show them the visual and use it. OK, so technology, digital literacy, yep. Like stability, yep. So yeah, it's about differentiating lessons to be able to um, accommodate all learners. And there are very simple ways to do that. Okay, so one thing about accessibility is if you make one small tweak for one person, you will find that it makes it much more accessible for everybody or most people or a lot of people. So for example, have a think in the chat room again. Uh, this is a wheelchair ramp. It's designed for people in wheelchairs, but it also helps other people. Who else does it help by making this small change? This, well, it's quite a big change, I suppose, but um, I'm not suggesting you go and do this in your language school if you, but 
if you could just have a think about who, yeah, parents with buggies, exactly. Anybody else that it can help? Little children, exactly, yeah. Yeah, people maybe who, yeah, older people. Yeah, okay, there's another couple of things. Yeah, skateboarders, exactly. I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> um, skateboarders and people with bikes, people with wheels, maybe people carrying things. It makes it so much easier. Okay, and what about tactile paving? It was originally developed for people with sight impairments. Can you think of somebody else or other people that this might help? Yeah, problems with directions, possibly, yeah. Yeah, it was for people with visual impairments originally, yeah. Problems with balance, perhaps, yeah. Okay, and you might relate to this. So if you're working walking towards a train, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who probably do this. I'm certainly guilty of doing it myself. So yeah, helping, uh, making a small change or making a change to be more accessible can help in not just people with, with, with that particular um, need, but also everybody or a lot of people. So one of the ways that we can adapt is by changing the font in our, so the Voices series is mostly in sans serif font, which I think is amazing. Um, so um, that's uh, lots of le learners with um, dyslexia can find it quite difficult to read serif fonts. So serif fonts are the ones on the far left, which have little flicks or tails like Times New Roman or, um, and, and then the, serif, the sans serif fonts are the ones that don't have flicks or tails that are much more simple. Like um, you could have dyslexia font or Century Gothic or Arial, Trebuchet. These are all sans serif fonts, which are easier to read for people with visual impairments and for dyslexia. Um, when it comes to size, uh, print, uh, minimum font 12 is the um, best font to use, uh, minimum is the minimum font for print. But if you're on a presentation, uh, 24, I would say go even bigger than that though, to be honest, and keep your the number of uh, words on your screen as small as possible. And if you're on a mobile phone and your learners are learning on a mobile phone, or sorry, if your learners are learning on a mobile phone, keep it even bigger. Um, maybe size 44, for example. Now, uh, it's not possible to have voices in size 44, because if it was, this is what voices would look like, which is a little bit impractical. So, um, but voices have, we have managed to get around this with the wonders of new technology or technology. For, so our online platform has, um, an option to download all the texts within the book and then create them yourself into your choose your own font. So you can actually download, for example, you can download dyslexia font for free. Um, and you can download, for example, Sassoon fonts, quite a good one if you've got students learning literacy, um, because it's, it's a handwriting font. And then you can choose the font size yourself. Um, there's also video scripts available um, it's if you want to have them read the video script at the same time as listening and reading texts available, um, sorry, reading text, the audio scripts available as well. So if any listening, they can read and listen at the same time, which can help uh, learners um, with uh, sight impairments, hearing impairments, and uh, dyslex uh, dys um, literacy. Okay. So yeah, the little changes come from that. There's also when uh, all the videos, all the video content uh, has subtitles. So this is Brian Castle. He is one of the explorers. And the explorers talk, the Na National Geographic explorers, so they're, for example, marine biologists working in Antarctica and other really cool jobs that I would absolutely love to have. Um, so he's a conservationist and 
uh, but he's talking about his free time. And in the video, you can uh, you can have the subtitles. You can also make it bigger with this little square so that the subtitles can be increased in size. Um, so that's helpful for yeah, le learners with uh, um, audio impairments, sight imp ah. uh, for hearing impairments, sorry. And also for learners, maybe if they're using it on the bus and they can't put their volume on or they're in a noisy place, then they can just read the subtitles and still manage to do their homework. Um, and the same with um, the writing texts. So you can have the writing text, you can enlarge the writing text to show on your screen or if you're online or if you are maybe in class and you're showing it on the uh, projector screen. Um, okay. So let's have a look at differentiation. So these, this is a learner with, um, you maybe be aware, someone said earlier about mixed levels of classes. Um, if I've never once taught a class that has exactly the same level of students with exactly the same level of skills. Um, I found, uh, I found that uh, my students there's always there's always someone that finishes quickly. There's always somebody that finishes that needs a bit more support. Some students are great at reading and writing. Some students are great at speaking and listening. So it's important to differentiate. So just in the chat, if there is, um, if you can think of any other ways to differentiate classes, I would love to hear your ideas. So these are some of the things that I do with my students. So. Uh, Tell them, I will give them difficult tasks and very difficult tasks. So if you say this is an easy task and this is a, a difficult task, they will guaranteed all go for the easy task. And that's not what we want. We want to challenge everyone and make, to make everybody think that they're getting a challenge. So if you give everybody a difficult task and a very difficult task, so that could just be, for example, um, asking students to if, for example, a listening or reading activity, get them to answer five questions. Or you could ask for the difficult task, they're answering three questions, for example. You could also split this by odds and evens. So students answer the odd questions or the even questions. And then if they're super fast, they can answer all the questions. Um, you can ask them, you could uh, change questions from multiple choice or open questions. So maybe uh, fast finishers could, you could give them open questions and uh, the students who need a bit, bit more support, you could give them a couple of options, uh, and, like multiple choice options, or you could get them to create their own questions. Uh, so that could be an extension task, getting them to create their own questions. Um, you could get them to write or draw definitions of things. You could get them to support other students. Um, so a bit of peer learning and peer support can be really helpful, especially if they maybe uh, you could help if, if they speak the language, but you don't, you could get them to translate some certain things if, if need be. Um, uh, drawings, I find that drawing little pictures can be quite helpful for concept checking and, and just yeah, to check their understanding and it can be quite a fun way to do that and quite a lighthearted way to do that. You quite often get a laugh out of it when you draw something quite badly. Um, you can provide language frames. So maybe if a question is um, what color is, and then you could maybe have the language frame or when does it start? And then you could have the language frame of it starts at or does she like it or she doesn't like it or she likes it because, or why does she like it? If the question is, why does she like it? She likes it because, so that they know where they're starting. Um, okay, so for example, this question, this is from the Beginner uh, Voices book. It's a lesson on hummingbirds. Um, and um, so how would you, this is a listening text. 
these are five questions for listening. Uh, how, how could you differentiate these based on, on with using your ideas and the ideas I've just given you? So for example, where do hummingbirds live? That's an open question. You could ask them, you could support them a little bit by giving them two options or even three options. Maybe South America, North America, Africa, for example. Are they light or heavy? You could change that as well to uh, what weight are they for uh, to make it an open question for the fast finishers. Are they fast or slow? You could change that to um, what speed do they go for the fast finishers as well. Um, what can hummingbirds do that others can't? You could get them to make lists. Um, where do they get their food? Again, you could give them options or you could provide a frame they get their food from, for example. And another thing that I really love doing is, um, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. One thing you could do is, so this is the actual um, course book itself. And you'll notice that it's quite busy because otherwise we would have a huge course book, as I pointed out at the beginning. Um, but you could ask students to cover just certain parts of the, 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 cover the book so that they're only looking at those questions so that they're focused on it. So this could be quite good if the students have ADHD and they're not focusing their attention but also good for learners who are just a bit distracted or who haven't necessarily listened to your instructions properly. Um, if, if they're just looking at those five, you could have them on the whiteboard or you could do this. Uh, this is a, a, gra a graphic organizer, I suppose. You could just draw this on the whiteboard. I draw the, drew this on the whiteboard last week. And for once in my life, <laughs> The students did not ask me to play the CD for the third time. Usually they're begging me to play the CD for the third time. But it's not a CD, the audio file for the third time. Um, and because I think because there was no text. So this is very wordy. They're focusing on reading the question at the same time as listening. This, all they have is five words and they just need to answer the, the place. Where are they from? The food, what do they eat? The weight, how, how, how are they heavy or light? Their speeds, are they fast or slow? Their size, uh, are they, um, and then they can complete the hummingbirds can. So this is a kind of language frame up the top. And I just want to play the audio for you because I want you to hear Anusha's wonderful voice uh, explaining and you can have a think about where everything goes. birds because they're beautiful. They live in North and South America. There are about 330 types of hummingbirds and they are many different colors. Hummingbirds aren't big. Large hummingbirds are about 7 to 13 centimeters long but small ones are only four centimeters long, about the size of your little finger. They aren't heavy either. Large hummingbirds weigh about 20 grams and small hummingbirds weigh just two grams. Hummingbirds are tiny, but they are really fast. They can fly about 40 kilometers an hour. They can also hover or stay in the same place when they fly. And they can fly backwards. Other birds can't fly backwards. Hummingbirds get their food from plants. They drink the nectar or sugar water from flowers. Okay, did you get what speeds they were? 
and the weight and the size. So this is what the students, um, I was a bit unfair there. I, I should have asked you to draw it first, um, but I'm feeling a bit like there's not maybe enough time. So yeah, the students would have this, um, either you could draw it beforehand or you could draw it on the whiteboard. I drew mine on the whiteboard and then asked students to write it in their notebooks. And then they came out with something like this. So this is what you could technically call a sketch note. You could ask them to draw as well their answers or um, yeah, you could ask them to draw their answers too if you want to, or you could just ask them to fill it in with the text as well. But I found it really reduced the processing load that the students had to have, that the students had when they were listening and it just really focused on getting the answers across. Okay, and then some learners in class, I don't know if you recognize these learners. I certainly have these learners. So the one on the right is the one who brings all the books. They go to the library, they've got their notebook, they've got their pen. And then the one on the left is the person who doesn't even bring a pencil to class. So you've got to make allowances for these students as well and make things accessible because some, some learners, so maybe the one on the right has um, a very strong educational background. Whereas the one on the left, maybe there's a number of reasons why they might be like this. It could be neurodiversity, or it could be that they haven't had the same experience of education. So they haven't had the same training. So um, in the workbooks, we have learning to learn boxes, which are brilliant. I'll just give you a minute to read this one on pronunciation. So overall, uh, they're given the study skills tip of to practice pronunciation, record the music, uh, record the um, record it on your phone, and maybe listen back. Um, you could also maybe get them to record it on WhatsApp and send it to each other. Okay, and another learning to learn box is here. I'll just give you a little bit of time to read it. So this is about contextualizing and personalizing the, the vocabulary. So it's a good way when you have teaching your vocabulary, um, many students, um, lots of uh, students with neuro neurodiversity, some have uh, difficulties with memory um, and getting them to remember. Uh, but that's also the same with, uh, uh, with pretty much all students, really. You just want to get them to repeat it as much as possible. And one way of doing that is to get them to contextualize it and write them, write a sentence and personalizing it is a good way to help them remember. Um, so the other things in learning to learn boxes, such as putting new words in groups, drawing pictures, making a text, remembering new phrases, protecting new vocabulary. Um, one of the ways I, one of the study skills I like to get my students um, to give myself students practice with is uh, notebooks. So I often find that the students who are the students on the left who need a bit more support um, maybe haven't quite learned how to use notebooks. So we'll train, I train them to have uh, maybe a notebook for scrappy notes and grammar activities and things that don't need, they don't need necessarily need to keep, but that just uh, notes and practice really, a practice notebook. And then the other notebook is for notes that they need, uh, like pretty notes that are all laid out well. So maybe the back is grammar, the front is vocabulary, the middle is a different section. Um, so one of the ways I do this is to draw a notebook on the whiteboard. So you'll see it's a very simple way of doing it. You draw a rectangle and I'm sure everybody can draw a rectangle. Do not tell me you cannot draw. Everybody can draw, it's just a case of basic simple shapes. Uh, so I'll draw the rectangle and then little C-shapes down the side to give it a spiral bound feel. And then you can ask them to add it. You can basically demonstrate exactly how you want the, it to be laid out. Um, uh, you can do this also with uh, 
uh, vocabulary organizers. So you could have a new word and then have a cloud for the word and then the definition in their language in another box and then a picture and then a, a example sentence again. So that's a good way to get them into the habit of recording vocabulary well. You could get them to create their own picture dictionaries as well. Uh, another way to um, uh, also for literacy learners, if they're first, if they're learning, if they're new to learning Roman script or new to reading and writing, um, you could ask them the, but draw attention to any phonics that comes up. So, for example, any interesting sounds like ng together or ch together or sh together. Lots of pronunciation actually sounds. Um, if you focus on the pronunciation of the sound, but also focus on the way it's spelled as well. So different different sounds and um, focus on the spelling of them as well. I tend to avoid the international phonetic alphabet in my classes because I find that. It confuses students with, they don't need to learn any additional symbols when they're already coming to terms with a whole set of new symbols. Um, lots of repetition, lots of spelling games and activities and give them a bit more time. Okay, so accessible learning tips. Um, Overall, ask the learner. What is most important is the learner themselves. Every learner is different. Every learner is an individual. Ask them what works for them because it's going to be different for each learner. Give clear instructions. Give demonstrations when you give those instructions. Uh, build confidence and have a welcoming atmosphere. So teach them, for example, that mistakes are good. Uh, there's no learning without mistakes. So the more they make the mistakes, the more they can learn. Um, so, and uh, yeah, just help them respect each other as well. Okay, uh, ADHD. Uh, for learners with ADHD, minimize distractions, uh, train students to take their time and allow movement and fidgets. Uh, for dyslexia, give extra time, use assistive technology, um, dyslexia friendly fonts and graphics. I'll share these um, sketch notes on social media in a couple of days. I know they're quite, they might be quite small. I'm a bit concerned I'm breaking my own accessibility rules for font size. This calculia, use multicentral tools, avoid memorizing. I'm also aware that <laughs> I'm kind of running out of time a little bit. Um, so um, avoid memorizing and teach in small chunks. Uh, literacy, draw attention to the sounds and spelling, allow copying. Copying is good when it comes to literacy and um, so do a lot of, um, uh, if you read a text and get them to write it, it's okay to have the text there for them as a, as a model. Um, review and repeat, repeat as much as you can, practice handwriting. Um, for study skills, you could get them to create plans together. Um, and practice notebook layout, set goals. For digital skills, uh, master one skill at a time. So for example, if, uh, for example, the first time you get on Zoom, just the first time of mastering that is getting them on Zoom and then work towards getting them to use the chat room, maybe get them to use the annotation tools once they've mastered that and then get the word, get them to use breakout rooms after that, and then get them to share their screen in breakout rooms. It's um, about building confidence within it. Give them lots of practice. Uh, you can create digital buddies as well. So maybe some students in the class are really good with digital skills. Some students need a bit more support. So you can match them up together and get them to help each other. Um, autism um, gives students a routine that can be very helpful. Allow them to work alone if that makes them feel okay, if, that, if they prefer that. Allowed, me, allow, uh, sorry, avoid metaphors and idioms. Idiomatic language can actually be, um, personally, I feel idiomatic language is not plain English. So I would uh, rather avoid idiomatic language in general and use things like visual calendars, which can be uh, easier for learners as well. Um, sensory impairments, 
uh, use large double spaced fonts, which I've uh, mentioned before, it's easy enough to do this with voices because we have all the text available. Provide text for hearing impairments, so it's such as subtitles, and don't rely on colour to convey meaning. So also avoid colours like red and green. Um, red and green can be quite difficult, especially for people with colourblind learners. And uh, backgrounds, so if you're using a coloured background, make the contrast really high. So try to make the text black or really dark navy or dark grey, um, and then the background really light. Uh, and mobility, just make as many adjustments as, as you can and any reasonable adjustments that you can. So that could be providing an ergonomic chair, it could be providing a computer with assistive technology in it, um, it could be providing uh, lifts or just having the classroom very close to a lift or to um, reduce the amount that they need to walk or that they need to move around and allow them to move around if they've got any um, sore backs or whatever. Okay, so now it's over to you. Um, I'd like you to have a look at a lesson in voices and think about ways that you can adapt it for different learners. So for example, this is um, a full page of text. It can be, I guess, quite overwhelming for certain learners. Uh, you might want to focus the attention a little bit. So in the chat box, can you give me some ideas of how you would make this more supportive? I'm just going to zoom in because I'm aware this is quite, uh, this might be quite small on some of your screens. So I'm just going to change the slide. So question one, look at the four photos on page 61. What are the people doing? And do you do these things? How would you make this simpler for your students? Okay, just while the chat's getting going. Yeah, describe the picture for one thing, yeah. One photo of them, exactly, yeah. You could do, yeah. Describe, yeah, you could zoom into one photo at a time. You don't need to show every single picture. You could show one photo at a time. You could show one question at a time as well. You don't necessarily need to show this rubric at all. You could just cut out the rubric. So just what are people doing? Do you do these things? You don't even need to show them the rubric. You could actually have um, the rubric, um, just say the rubric as, as your information, as your um, instructions. Yeah, compare pictures. Other things you could do, you could get um, learners to describe the picture for any students with visual impairments. So that's them practicing their English too. Um, you could ask fast finishers to write down as many words as you possibly can to describe each picture. You could get them to write their own questions. Okay. And then you can also have a look at this one. So this is the text. And actually, I did say earlier that the majority of voices is in sans serif font. So I actually selected this partly because it's not in sans serif font. It's actually quite a uh, rare occurrence for there to be um, text in serif, no, yeah, serif font. So this is, I think, is probably Times New Roman or something like that. So what, what's one thing you could do to adapt this particular lesson? Scrolling through so many messages on the chat. This is great. I can't keep up with them. And so many, they look great ideas. With 54 new messages to scroll down. Yeah, so the first, somebody said use a sans serif font. So go to the uh, online platform, get the text and change it to a sans serif font. You could also get them to... Um, you could also display the text around the room and do it as a running dictation. I think this would be quite good for people with, um, for students who like to move around a lot or have a bit of, quite a lot of energy. Uh, you could do it as a jigsaw reading. So one student reads one, another student reads another, another student reads another, and then describe it. You could also 
uh, for students who need more support, just have them focus on one text. And then for faster students, ask them to read more texts and then describe it to the other students. Um, for the que in terms of the questions, read the four headings in Article A to D, match them with the photos. So you could do this um, tactilely as well. You could actually cut out the pictures and have them match them, or you could have them match them around the room. Um, you could have them listen to the audio as well when they're reading, if they have uh, learners with literacy needs or learners with um, visual impairments, or maybe even you could set it for homework as an audio and have it as a listening instead. You could make a gra graphic organizer like the hummingbird one. So read the article again, question four, read the article again, working pairs and answer the questions. Why do people sometimes prefer to stay indoors? You could give options. You could have that multiple choice. What are some ways to exercise at home? Again, that could be multiple choice. You could have pictures as multiple choice. Um, if in terms of literacy, you could point out some phonics. So for example, the chairs, it's got ch in it, and then it's got this A sound in the AI. It's got um, quite a few words that have silent E at the very end, like exercise and uh, game and online. Got quite a few words with ing, like evening. Uh, it's got some double letters like dinner with a double N. Usually I would have the annotation tools actually to point these things out, but I'm afraid they're disabled here. Um, They've not been there. Uh, it's not a. It's not. It's not possible in this webinar. So I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. I'm not able to point those out. Um, okay. Yeah. Match the pictures to the texts. Um, what other things can you do for this one? Okay. I think I've covered all the main points. So. Um, on this particular text. So I'm just gonna have a look for some more ideas in the chat. Yeah, using pictures, yeah, good. Yeah, finding their own favorite activity as well. That's really personalizing it and help them remember. Okay, and then there's this vocabulary activity. So you'll notice the vocabulary activity on the left has actually already been split up into one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. This reduces the processing load. So students are only matching one to four with A to D and then five to eight with E to H rather than matching one to eight with A to H, which can get a bit messy, but also can be a bit confusing and a bit overwhelming. So how could you adapt this to make it uh, for different learners as well? Any ideas? I'll keep an eye on the chat. One of the things I would do for fast for fast finishers, I would maybe cover E to H and then get them to think of their own collocations. So, for example, read a book, read a newspaper, read uh, social media, for example, and get them to think. Yeah, miming games is a great idea. Yeah. Uh, making compound words, exactly. Good. Another idea would be to have a uh, put question six first so that you're having students are thinking about what each image is so for example read a book uh, e is sing a song b is chat online f is listen to music so they've already um, talked about the vocabulary and then they're going back to do the matching with the words so they're doing the visual exercise first and then they're going back to do the um, the text version afterwards. Um, you could ask them to copy the words to their notebooks, uh, create picture dictionaries with it. These are actually really quite interesting because they're icons. 
and graphic facilitators use. I, basically, the simple drawings that I do are copying icons. So uh, icons are much easier to copy than clip art or any sort of illustrations or cartoons. So, for example, the headphones, you could copy them quite easily with just a upside, like a kind of end shape and then two little uh, circles at the side to make a set of headphones. So you could create a picture dictionary with that. Um, uh, you could enlarge the text for any learners that need it to be enlarged by using the online platform or, um, and you could cover sections as well so that they're only seeing this bit. Okay, good. Keep on, keep the like, ideas coming in the chat. I'm really loving these. Okay, and one last thing I'd like to say about voices is that, or and about accessibility in general, is the uh, need for representation and for students to be represented. So in voices, we want to give students a voice. We want students to be represented. We want to feel that they are part of the book. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a very global series. We've got the explorers that are from all over the world, but we've also got, and we've got content from all over the world, international communication skills, and the pronunciation is lots of different accents from all over the world. You'll notice that I have a non-standard accent. I, am a, I have a Scottish accent. For many years, I struggled when I was teaching pronunciation because it got to that point where I thought, this isn't how I say it. I'm not wrong, my pronunciation is not wrong, just as most of the world's pronunciation is not wrong. Um, we've just been using one language model for many years or a couple of language models for many years. So we, um, so voices, the aim of voices is to, uh, pronunciation is for learners to be, intel to be understood and for it to be intelligible. So all accents are beautiful um, and should be embraced. And so I am delighted to be part of this series and be have my accent is, is my accent is not wrong anymore, which is great. And um, so uh, yeah, so I selected these pictures. This is just from beginner, the beginner book, and the, this is the same the whole the whole way throughout the course. And this is just a small selection of some of the images. Um, they are so inclusive. You've got the um, on the top left, you have Iris Apfel, who is a, uh, she works in fashion and she's still working. And she is an older person who is not a grandparent. Often in course books, you see um, older people being represented solely as grandparents or quite frail. But um, in voices, that's, we've definitely pushed, managed to push the boundaries on that one and uh, be a bit more reflect, reflect reality more, really. Um, we've got our woman of color who's a pilot. Now you've got the Alaskan um, uh, family. And uh, in the top right corner, we've got a, um, a woman in a wheelchair at the gym. And she's just included there with uh, other uh, people who are also doing activities. Um, and in the bottom left, we have a woman who quite clearly own that business and are uh, doing really like enjoying themselves with with their business. Um, got the international table of people in the middle, and then in the bottom we've got uh, people laughing and having a good time. And I just yeah, I just really think um, rep represent having re learners represented through their through stories, through contexts, through um, through images is so crucial. Uh, in Voices also has an explore more section. So at the end of most lessons, there is an explore more where learners can go off and do some um, extra research, mostly some uh, online research. So if you want to find more online research into accessibility, these are some of my go-to accessibility heroes, really. So eltwell.com is Anne-Margaret Smith. I've just finished her neurodiversity course and I cannot speak more highly of it. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the Reflecting Reality Diverse and Inclusive ELT Materials is a Facebook group that uh, is 
has Lottie, Lottie Galpin as the admin and she was my um, workbook editor. She worked closely on the series. Uh, I've got quite a few blog posts at emilybrysonelt.com on accessibility and fonts and digital literacy and literacy and all sorts of inclusive topics. And there's also the hashtag how to inclusive, which I think is just on Twitter, but could be on other platforms. I'm not too sure. I'll need to check that out. Maybe you can have a search too. Okay, so I think that's me. If you have any questions, I would love to hear them. I think Alex maybe has collated them already. Well, I mean, in the chat, there weren't too many, but in the, uh, in the actual Q&A book, there, there's a couple of questions. Um, one question was, dear Emily, how, how can we know if someone is autistic? Oh, okay. So I mean, it's, it's going through the hard hitting questions there. That's a good question. That's so hard to actually tell neurodiversity so, because it's such a spectrum. Um, and because there's not always assessments, um, it could be that somebody could be autistic for a large part of their life and not be aware of it. And uh, it depends, yeah. Some traits are that maybe they are not very, um, they kind of keep themselves to themselves. They count, some people with autism have a very good memory for facts. Um, other, yeah, the others, they can take things very literally. Um, so maybe they won't take, if you have a joke with them or use some sort of idiomatic language, they might take it a bit literally. Um, what else for autism? Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what's in my sketch note about the, the talk. It's got it's all gone. Uh, um, but yeah, you can. Yeah, I would, I would maybe. Uh, yeah, for in terms of it's not. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to like just ask. Well, you yeah. Yeah, not it's not it's not really our place to go and get them. Ask them to get an assessment, I suppose. If you suspect it, it's just about making um, making changes to your practice on the suspicion that maybe there is one, I think. And then if they want to, you can have that discussion with them to go and get an assessment. But it, some people, if they function perfectly fine not knowing, they may be perfectly happy not knowing. I've had a friend recently that's just been, um, uh, that's just recently had an ADHD assessment. She's in her 40s, she's very successful. Um, and she wouldn't otherwise have known if it hadn't, if some people hadn't brought it up with her really. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I hope it does. <laughs> yeah, really, lots, lots of information good. online. I would recommend going to Anne Margaret Smith's ELT Well website and checking that out because there's lots of information there. She's got some really nice um, Deco comics as well. D-E-K-K-O have some really nice uh, comic books about uh, neurodiversity as well. Okay, thank, thank you, Amy. And I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of the time, they don't know themselves if they are suffering from any kind of accessibility issues. And, and it's certainly not our job as teachers to diagnose that. But yeah. We just need to be aware of signs and adjust our, our teaching our materials as best we can to suit as many students as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm 100% sure that I have lots of students in my class that have undiagnosed neurodiversity and specific learning differences. And the difficulty is, especially when it comes to dyslexia, it's really hard to figure out, is that student spelling badly because they've got dyslexia or are they spelling badly because they've just not practiced or not been around English enough? Or it's really hard to know. It is but really tough. And Margaret Smith does have a toolkit for that. So perfect. We will be yeah. sure to check that out. Um, I think, Emily, there have been so many sort of great points you've made today um, on a really important <laughs> issue. And, I, and as I say, that's more questions coming through. Um, one from here from Julie. How, how to communicate to beginners that we want to support? Do they have needs, issues, problems that they have difficulty accessing the lesson? That's, what, that's in the QA. In what, in what way? In, in well, that's a good question. Julie, do you want to maybe expand on that? Is that, is that accessing the learning, learn, learning digitally or? I get, yeah, yeah. I get. I think I often, it's maybe my own assessment with beginners rather than them coming to me 
and telling me that they're finding it difficult to act. Like a lot, they'll be very vocal if they can't access it digitally. Oh no, teacher, I've lost my password. Oh no, I've got um, I can't I can't use the link. It doesn't work. I'm locked out of my computer. They're very vocal with that, but they're less vocal when it comes to I just didn't understand what the question was. I find so it's about I think it's about maybe preempting that making it accessible before it's not accessible. Does that make sense? That, that makes perfect sense, I think, Emily, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, I think time, time is very much up. So it just leaves me to say thank you to you, Emily, for your time, your ideas. Like I say, I think it's a really important issue that within the world of ELT, we need to be addressing more than we maybe have done in the past. And also a big thank you to everybody who's joined today. Um, there's been the chat has been really, really yeah, busy. Amazing. So clearly, clearly it's you know, it, it is a topic that people are interested in, that they, you know, they want to make their classes as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so just a little bit of kind of uh, admin to finish off the session. So in the chat, people have been asking about the recording and certificates. So, like I said at the start. Tomorrow, you will have an email from Zoom, and this will contain a link to the certificate. It will also contain a link to the recording. It will also have a link to the lesson plan and a survey that we would love for you to complete as well. And then next week, in case that email goes missing, we'll email you again directly from National Geographic Learning, and there will also be a link to request a sample of voices there as well. But if you want more information right now, please feel free to head over to the National Geographic Learning sites. Um, there's more content there. We have the In Focus page where Emily's got a blog that links to her talk today. Um, we've also got past webinars. Connect with us on Facebook as well. And then the last thing to say is that this is just one of many webinars we are doing over, the, over this kind of period to promote, to support the launch of Voices. Um, so next month, we have a session with another co-author, Lewis Lansford, on the 27th and 29th of April. And he will be talking about must-have skills for global communication. So you'll be able to find links on that online, but otherwise take a screenshot a scan of that QR code. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Emily, for your time. Uh, thank you for all your great ideas and suggestions. And again, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Thanks, everybody. It's been great. Have a lovely evening, and we will see you next time. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.